About a year ago, I put out a video entitled My Four Methods of Capturing Nightscape Images. Well, since I put that video out, I've modified a few things in my workflow and I thought it would be time to upgrade that video. So today I want to present to you my five methods of capturing nightscape images. Now, of course, there will be a lot of repetitiveness from that video to this one, so I hope you bear with me with that. But I want to go through all of those methods again and describe to you why I would use any of those particular methods. So here we go. The first method, of course, is single shot nightscape images. Now, this is a very common way that most people begin their nightscape shooting, and I did as well. And uh, these days, to be absolutely honest with you, I don't do a whole lot of single shot nightscape photography. Uh, and it's probably because I've worked through a number of other techniques at which I will get onto as we go through this video. But nevertheless, I wanna show you a few images that I did shoot a while ago and I'll just w walk you through very briefly how I did that. So my first image today is this single tree uh, sitting in a paddock just lit with a light to the side with the Milky Way behind. And you can see uh, the light is very blue. Now that is because this is an LED light. And I learned as I went through my nightscape photography journey that LED lights produce blue tones in my nightscapes. Since then, I've put gels on my lights and things like that to change the color. But this one highlights that blue color. But having said that, I actually quite like the image. It's something a little bit different and um, I, I've just left it as it was. Now, this next image is a little bit similar in a way, except I used an orange gel and I was experimenting with gels at the time. And I lit this Malmesbury Railway Bridge with a, it was a 24 millimeter focal length lens. So it was very difficult to get the whole subject in. And, and so of course the, the foreground subject has come through quite yellow, but it's a single exposure and it, it was not easy to shoot and light this large structure in just one single exposure. But I still really like this particular image. Uh, now this next one is an image that I was finished shooting for this particular night and I was on my way home and I looked up between the trees and I could see the Milky Way just uh, sort of uh, finding a gap in the top of the canopy of the trees. And so I stopped the car on the side of the road, no cars around, no one around, put my camera there on the road, lined it up and just shot it in one single exposure. Just a little bit of light painting around the, the, on the road section so you can sort of place it and sort of get a, a feel for where it is. And I think that's really important. When you're shooting nightscapes, often people will just shoot silhouettes. Now I've got no problem with silhouettes, but the silhouette has to make sense. So if you've got all this massive amount of trees uh, and it, it can become just a blob of black, and it really doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So in this particular case, I just put a little bit of light around and which I typically do just to give definition to the foreground. And I really do like how that one came up as well. Now, this is another one I took. This is way, way back in my nightscape photography journey. It's a railway line again with just a little touch of light painting with the Milky Way core stretching down in that Western sky as it does here in Australia later on in the Milky Way uh, year. And uh, this is a single exposure shot with a 14 millimeter lens. So it's very wide angle and um, it still holds a, a, a little special place in my heart, as does this next shot. Now this is a railway bridge down at Taradale, not far from where I live here in Australia. And there's a train going across the bridge. Now this holds a special place in my heart because it was pretty much the turning point in my nightscape photography on this particular night. I went out and shot at this bridge. I was only half prepared to be absolutely honest with you because I was on my way home from another event uh, doing some video production. And I stopped by the bridge and I thought, man, this is just beautiful out here. So I shot and I heard the train coming, single exposure. Now this is shot with a Sigma 28 millimeter F1.8 lens. It's nowhere near uh, an ideal lens for nightscape photography. It's got coma all around it. But even so, the image looks pretty good. And all of the light from this particular image has simply come from the headlight on the train itself. Now, of course, the, the last in this section is uh, this little trike at the uh, Rostrada Country House Workshop venue. And it's just a single exposure. You've seen this, there's a video all about this on my channel. And it is one of my favorites even to this day. I shot these many years ago. 
It's a single exposure shot with a 35 millimeter lens. So it compresses the background and puts those stars out of focus because my focus point was on the trike itself. Just one little light source from behind the trike. So it's a single shot and you know, it just highlights how such a simple composition and a single exposure photograph can look so impressive. And so I absolutely love this image. Okay, so now moving to method two. So what method two is for me is a single shot sky background, but with multiple foreground images and typically light painted. Now, if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, you would have seen myriad amount of images shot with this method. The first one I wanna show you is a motorbike, which a friend of mine had at one of our photography sites. And so we decided we'd shoot this. Again, this is shot with a 35 millimeter lens. And what that does, it brings that background in a little bit closer. And you can see that there's a single shot here of the Milky Way sky focused to infinity on the stars. Then what we've done is refocused on the motorbike without moving the camera or tripod. It takes a bit of practice to do this, but you've got to be very careful, refocus, stop down the aperture and do some, uh, and also stop down the ISO and do some light painting on the foreground motorbike. And you can see from this image, it came up really, really well. I was very, very pleased uh, with that. Now, the next shot is shot with a 20 millimeter focal length. Now this is a, a bit bigger subject matter, this old mill. And again, it's a single exposure for the background sky shot at infinity. And in fact, all of these are shot at infinity because the building is so far away, infinity focus has everything in focus anyway. There's only a very short number, probably two or three images of the light painted foreground in this one. So it's a, it's a fairly simple shot, but even so I'm using multiple foreground layers as I suggested. This next image is using a moonlit night sky. Uh, and, the, and the moon is actually in the shot, so it's quite overexposed. But it was sort of the look that I was after for this particular shot. Once again, there's only a couple of shots on the foreground because there was a fair bit of light around because of that moon. But I just needed a little bit more definition on the front of the building because all the light was coming from behind. And so this falls into the category of method number two because I've done more than one image. It doesn't have to be more than a, a whole heap of shots to, to fall into this category, but it can be as many as maybe two on the foreground or as many as 10 or 20, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I was pretty happy with that shot. This one is a, a, another one that falls into this category because it's a single exposure for the sky background, but it's a selfie shot. Uh, I shot this quite a few years ago when I had the old Falcon um, and I, I, I like this image. There's three or four images shot separately of the foreground. One of those includes flash. So I was mixing my lighting sources here and I actually have a video talking about this very image here. You can have a look at up here. So uh, th there are many, many methods and many, many, many ways of achieving the outcome. So, but this is still a single shot sky and multiple foreground images. Now this old ruin I shot down at, at a location, not that far from where I live, and this is a typical example of this method and one that I've employed for so long now because I've got really good results. And you can get such fine detail in the foreground and that's basically because I'm lowering that ISO, uh, closing down my aperture, and that gives you a sharper image. I talk about dynamic range quite a lot. Dynamic range is basically the, the ability of your camera to capture the white whites and the black blacks. Now the higher you lift your ISO in your camera, the more diminished your dynamic range becomes. So by using this method of, of shooting different settings for the foreground to what I shoot for the sky, which is not possible in a single exposure, then I'm increasing my dynamic range because I'm lowering my ISO and closing down my aperture. So I'm getting much sharper foreground images. And I think it's well worth doing for that very reason. And of course, one more here. This is old Bessie, the gig out of the uh, farm where I often shoot and the lantern. I've called it Bessie and the lantern for obvious reasons. And once again, it's, it's, it's a beautiful image, but it's using this method of stopping down the aperture and the, lowering the ISO. And you'll notice in most of the methods from here on, I'm using the same method to shoot my foregrounds. Not a whole lot is going to change there. Uh, method three is actually an extension of method two. So method three employs stacking my sky images. In other words, shooting more than one background sky image. So 
apart from that, it's the same as method two, really. So what I'm doing is shooting typically between six and 10, sometimes up to as many as 15 of the same shot, same tripod position, same setting, same everything of the sky with the intention of stacking for noise reduction. So the question has to be asked, why would I bother to stack my images? Well, I just gave you a clue. It dramatically impacts on the ability of the software to remove the noise from the image. In other words, you get very clean images. The other question everyone's going to ask is, well, when you stack all these images and you're shooting, say, 10 or 15 second shutter speeds for each one, the sky is moving. And that's true, it is moving. And so how do you line them up? Well, the reality is the software does all the work. I don't know how it works, but I use Sequator for Windows. You can use Starry Landscape Stacker for Mac. And that also freezes the foreground and lines up the stars. Now that's magic. It's an absolutely fantastic program and I use it all the time. In fact, I'm still using it for pretty much everything that I'm doing. And of course, the foreground is still lit from different angles using my fine art light painting technique, which I've talked about at length. I'll just run you through a few examples. Now this old plow at the farm, you can see, has a stacked sky and multiple layered and blended images for the foreground. And you can see there's just so much clarity in both the sky and the foreground. It's the same thing that I've done with all of these images. Now this old, old structure, it's fallen down. It's just, just about ready to be flattened on the ground, but it still had enough texture and it had enough framework and so forth for me to shoot it one night. And I went out there and did the same method on this. Uh, you may remember, this is where I got, well, I, I didn't really get attacked by the spider, but there was a spider just behind my shoulder and I had no idea that it was there until everybody highlighted that in my video. So that was, that was a little bit of fun. Um, and this other structure here, now a friend of mine uh, showed me these old trucks. It was actually someone's front garden ornament in their front lawn garden, believe it or not. It's a big garden ornament, but we shot it there and I used this method to stack the sky for noise reduction and light paint the foreground. This was a difficult subject to light paint because it's big and it has odd, strange shapes, but that's how I did it. The same method as I've been talking about, as is this next one, which I've entitled Parked Outside the Shed. And this is the old gig at the farm parked outside the shed where it normally resides. And the Milky Way stretching over the top, it looks beautiful. And I couldn't resist it this night when I was there. Shot about 10 shots of the night sky, stacked for noise reduction. Did my fine art light painting on the front. And I think it came up really, really well. I love it. And the same with this one. Look, it's getting a, a bit monotonous, isn't it? Because I'm using the same methods here to do all of these images. And you know, that is the key. The key is to have a work flow that works for you, that you know backwards. And you know when you get out on location, you know exactly what you're going to do. Because a lot of people get out on location, look at their subject and say, man, how am I gonna shoot this? That's not how I operate. I get there knowing exactly what I have to do to get it. Now, of course, you've still got to compose the shot. You've still got to line up all the things. You've got to get your exposures right. You've got to get your lighting right. But at least I know the methodology that I'm going to employ before I take the shot. And just one more here, we've got this gorgeous shot of this tree overlooking the lake. And I've used exactly the same method, method number three, stacking for noise reduction for the sky and using multiple light painted blended foregrounds. Okay, so method number four is similar to method number three in that I'm using a stacked sky images. So for uh, getting that noise reduction in check, but I'm also using stacked long exposure foregrounds. Now, sometimes I will mix this up and I will do some light painting in the foregrounds as well. But the examples I'm showing you here, so for example, this one here at Dove Lake down in Tasmania, there's no light painting at all. It is simply just long exposure foregrounds blended with uh, stacked sky at shorter exposures. Same with this one at Lake McIntosh, again down in Tasmania. So when I was in Tasmania a couple of years ago, I use this method a lot because it was very dark and it's hard to light paint objects that are a long way away. And this is another example of that. I love this shot. I just love the way the Southern Cross pops out through those faint clouds. And also at Eddystone Lighthouse. Now this is down in Tasmania and uh, the only light source in this image is from the lighthouse itself. So there is a stacked sky and there's also three or four stacked images of the foreground. So I often will stack 
the foreground. In other words, take more than one exposure of the foreground. And typically that can be 30 seconds, it can be a minute, two minutes, five minutes, doesn't matter what the foreground exposure is. The longer the exposure is, the more light gathering ability your camera will have, even in pitch blackness. And it works really, really well. Now this image here, I've showed you a couple of times before. This is the, the river with some ambient and light painted foreground. So this is the mixture that I was telling you about. So what I've got here is a stacked sky for noise reduction at lower shutter speeds. Then I've lengthened the shutter speed for an ambient long exposure foreground. I think I took two or three of those and stacked them together. Again, stacking those images decreases the noise levels dramatically. So it's well worth doing. And then I've sprinkled in uh, just a little bit of light painting to add some highlights. Because one of the things you'll find when you do long exposure foregrounds, the, the foreground itself can be quite flat and dull. It's a little bit like, it's, it's basically a bit like moonlight. Moonlight is flat and dull because it's a, it's, a, it's a light source that is not giving you a whole lot of shape. Whereas light painting gives you a lot of shape and character. It can be overbearing and a lot of people think it's, it's too much sometimes. So you've got to balance it out. But that's what I did in this particular exposure. And now a couple I want to show you here from my fairly recent trip down to the Great Ocean Road. And both of these are panoramas. So that confuses the issue again, I realize that, uh, because I'm not strictly speaking stacking the sky for these panoramas, I'm just shooting panoramas as such. But I did separate panoramas for the foreground at a longer ambient exposure. Now, your immediate question is why did I do that? Well, I did it because there's not enough light to light the foreground, so I had to lengthen the shutter speed. And because the foreground is not moving, then I've got all the time in the world to be able to take as many shots as I need to. I could stack 10 of them, I could stack 20 if I wanted to. And in this case, in these, both of these panoramas that you're looking at now down at Childers Cove and the Bay of Islands, I just did long exposure foregrounds. Now these are panoramas because they had such a wide expanse of foreground and, and real estate if you like, to capture. Now, of course, that's the, the, the question. Why would you employ this particular method? Generally, and typically for me, it's when there's a big open landscape where I don't have any option to light something that's so far away, I just can't possibly do it with a torch or any other way. So I will use the longer exposure method and it gets into those shadow areas and brings that light out. And the more that you stack those foreground long exposures, the more you can increase the shadows in Lightroom or Photoshop and not increase the noise levels. It is absolutely magic, it's fantastic. Sometimes you can't, you might be on a cliff face or something and you can't actually get out on an angle to, to do the light painting. So I, I'll employ those methods in that case. So here we come to method number five. Now this is a little bit different to last year's video. And of course you probably already guessed, th this is by using a star tracker to shoot my night sky images. And by definition, when using a star tracker, it necessitates the need to blend in a separate foreground. Why is that? Because when you're shooting using a star tracker, it's following the stars across the sky. And therefore, any foreground that you shoot is going to be blurry and unusable. So you can use method five with all of the previous methods. You can shoot single exposures with method five, albeit with a blurry foreground. But if the, the um, exposure time is short enough, you can probably get away with something that's a long way away. Um, I don't typically do that. I, I don't like any blurriness in, and, and non-definition in the foreground. I've already mentioned that. So I'd like to show you a few examples of mine that I have shot using a star tracker to include into my workflow. So the first image here you can see is an Orion portrait at, at <laughs> a place called Suicide Rock. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I didn't jump off the rock. But this is shot at 35 millimeters with a tracked sky background, then refocused. That, so the, the tracking of course is at infinity focus. Then I've refocused onto the rock, stood up there and shot one single exposure, I think it was for the foreground because I was up there and I used flashes to light. So I can't light myself with a torch, so I used flashes. And I was pretty happy with how this one actually came up. It looks, it looks fantastic. The next one, of course, this is another image that I, I, I just absolutely blown away by this image. And it is so simple. I'm actually blown away by the simplicity of this image. So it's a single silhouette foreground 
This is shot at 50 millimeter focal length, but you can see the background sky is tracked and so much detail comes out in that sky. And I just love how the blend of this shot with the silhouette of the windmill looks just so magical. And it is one of my favorite images to date. And it's so simple. So it, this is an example where a silhouette works beautifully because of the defined, I guess, definition, if you like, especially of that windmill. But you can see that the hills rolling off into the background. So really, really nice. And of course, some of you are wondering what the light source is on the horizon. That's a moonrise. It was a crescent moon rising just behind the subject later on. So I took the tracked sky first before the moon was coming up and then the moon started to come up. So then when I blended the two together, it's a, it's a good combination of both images. So I absolutely love that. Uh, so here, oh, this, this is yet another example of how beautiful a simple silhouette foreground can look. So this is a tree, just a single exposure of a tree made into a silhouette with again, 50 millimeter. Now, you know how much I love using longer focal length lenses. So this is 50 millimeters. If I could shoot 50 millimeter skies, nightscapes, I would do it all the time because it just brings that Milky Way so much closer. So this is one of my favorites. I only shot it a few weeks ago and it employs this method of using the tracker, incorporating, blending the foreground. And it is one of my favorites, even though I've only just taken it not long ago. Now, here's another one. Now, this is uh, a little more complicated in that I've light painted the foreground, but very simply, only a shot from one side and then another shot from the other side. Then I've blended in the 50 mil, again, a 50 millimeter background. So in this particular shot, the foreground is shot at 35 millimeter focal length. The background is 50 mil. So that's, that's a focal length blend. And that's a bit of creative license I took. I don't expect everyone to like that or to employ that method. It doesn't matter. It's, I'm just showing you the methodology I use to create the image. So just a little bit of light painting on the foreground, tracked night sky, and then blending together. And by the time they blend together and, and working through the blending has been the thing I've been doing mostly in the past few months since I've had my new tracker. And oh boy, oh boy, I'm blown away with, with the results that are possible to get with that method. And oh, here's another one. I did a, a video on this one as well. So this is Orion over the top of this beautiful old wooden structure. Now, once again, this is a focal length blend. So Orion in the background is shot at 50 millimeters and the building in the foreground is shot at 20 millimeters. So forgive me for that if you don't enjoy that method. But again, it's, it's just showing you the way that I've done this. Now, the foreground is lit with my standard fine art light painting method, the same as I've always done for many, many years now. All I've done different here with this methodology is to include a tract sky background rather than the stacked method or the single exposure method from what I was explaining to you before. The only real difference between all of this is that um, by definition, because it's a track shot, I'm moving the tripod. Now, before you remember that I said when I was using the single shot backgrounds and the stacked backgrounds, it's really important not to move the tripod between any of the shots. Well, of course, that goes out the window when you're using your star tracker because you have to move the tripod because it's moving with the stars. So that's where the complications come in and that's where the difficulty comes in. And that's why I've been working on this method for so long now, but I'm pretty happy with how it's going at this point in time. Uh, and one more I wanna show you, this is by the water's edge. This is one that I shot just a couple of weeks ago. And this employs uh, a little bit different method to the, all of the others. Yes, I've tracked the sky, but the foreground is long exposure ambient light, no light painting at all. So you can see how I'm mixing and matching all of these methods. So method number five here, which I'm incorporating tracked skies is actually using uh, a, a mixture of nearly all of the other methods that I've mentioned. And that brings me to a conclusion. But what it does mean is that all of the methodology that I use to shoot all of my nightscape photography is pretty much uh, the same thing that I would use depending on whatever method I'm using. In other words, I'm using the same stacking for noise reduction. I'm using the same light painting with my angles and getting my light. And I'm also, as you can see, I'm using the same method for capturing ambient lighting. So I'm stacking for noise reduction for most of these images. In fact, I'm stacking my tracked images often also for noise reduction. 
Now I'm taking sometimes two minute long exposures and I might take 10 of them in a row. So that's 20 minutes worth of exposures, I'm stacking them. That's how come I can get so much more detail out of that tracked night sky. So there you go, there's my five methods as of now, maybe next year I'll have six methods, who knows? But you see, I'm constantly challenging myself to push beyond the boundaries and to incorporate whatever new technology is out there and what methods are there that are available for all of us to shoot our awesome night sky and landscape. So thanks so much for watching, I really appreciate that. Love to read your comments down below. If you wanna to subscribe to the channel, I would be wrapped to have you on board. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.